So anyway, we, uh, in the dialogue, uh, we have this back and forth taking place between Socrates and Polus again. Gorgias came in briefly, was really quite honest with what he thought he was all about and why and so forth, but as you know, he got tripped up a little bit by Socrates when he said, well, you know, if my students don't know what justice is, uh, I guess I have a responsibility to teach them, but yet I don't have a responsibility for what they do. So um, Polis comes back in and, and uh, he says, well, now I'm going to start asking you questions, which is really good in a way because truly Socrates hasn't been asked very many questions. And you know at the beginning he said, I want to ask and answer. I want to have a back and forth. But it's really been all you know, being peppered by Socrates' questions. So Polis asks Socrates, what do you think rhetoric is? What kind of art do you think rhetoric is? And Socrates disputes that it's even an art at all. So we have to understand why he makes this distinction. He says it's a knack and not an art. And of course, this is in translation, okay? But what um, art, the, the Greek term for art would be techne. And it means something like a skill that you have to teach people, that you can perfect, that a human being can learn and perfect. Okay? Whereas a knack is something that a person just sort of has. It really can't be taught. It can't be honed. Um, on page 25 down at the bottom, he says, uh, it's not an art, it's a knack because it is unable to render any account of the nature of the methods it applies. And so it cannot tell the cause of each of them. So in other words, Socrates is, is strongly implying that Gorgias can't really teach it to people the way he advertises. That, you know, Gorgias would advertise, I can teach you to be a great public speaker, but the truth is that some people have this ability and they can enhance it if they have it but other people it's always going to be a struggle and when they learn the skill it's going to be mechanical and they're never going to be great orators okay so that there's something there that you just have to have and it's not like this wonderful art that you can build a science around and you can teach right so he's he's diminishing it he's it's a little it's a little insult to the the so-called art of rhetoric. He's saying it's not an art, it's not a serious field of study. And so, you know, you, you, Gorgias, are teaching something really that isn't all that worthy uh, of anybody's time. He makes this comparison between an art and a knack as he sees it to kind of develop what, why he makes the distinction. He says that, uh, for instance, uh, there is the knack of makeup. You know, some people can apply it well. It makes them look great. Other people, and I'm sure you've noticed this just from watching television, you know, they can put it on, but it doesn't make them look better. Um, but, you know, the goal is when you, when you put on makeup is definitely you want to look good. And when you think about it, the ultimate underlying goal is you want to look healthy. You want to look vibrant. You want to look like... Uh, attractive, you know, and attractiveness deep down at the instinctual level has to do with with being healthy, you know, so that you can have a family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, when you put on your lipstick next time, think about that, right? But <laughs> so, but it, it he says a knack produces a false sense of whatever it is that you're trying to do, whereas. In this case, gymnastics or basically exercise produces the real thing. Okay, so whereas makeup at its best produces the look of health and attractiveness, um, working out, okay, produces the real thing. That glow, the uh, you know, uh, being in shape and so forth. Okay, and he also says the same sort of comparison applies between cookery and medicine. Now. We know now that the, the, the two are somewhat tied together, right? Because actually nutrition has become a part of medical science. And, and, uh, but I think that Socrates thought that people who were natural herbalist types, you know, that had sort of natural home remedies for things, couldn't compare to the emerging science of medicine, which was really rather primitive at that time. But there were people trying to actually develop medical procedures 
there were some surgeries being done, some successfully, believe it or not, many not. Um, but still, in his estimation, this was a science. And it was you know, knowledge that could be transmitted and it could be built upon. And the outcome of it would actually improve your health, hopefully, if it was successful. Whereas this was just sort of hope, hocus pocus. It was hoping, I should say. So uh, you can see, you know, he thinks an art is a field of study that aims at and hopefully progresses towards real, real achievements, real improvement. Okay? Now, <clears throat> so he goes on to strongly imply <laughs> that rhetoricians are fakes or phonies, that they put themselves up to be something that they're not, this, these true teachers of politics, so to speak, okay? And that they teach people to produce a false sense of justice, that in fact rhetoric produces a false sense of justice, okay? And you know how they do that, right? You listen to a speech, the speaker kind of gets you all emotional about something, and you feel like whatever it is that he's proposing, if you approve of it, you are just. The cause is just, and then you, by attaching yourself to it and approving of it, you become just. Okay? And that is the, the great method by which the rhetorician gets the, the listener to agree to what he has to say. So Socrates says it produces a false sense of justice because what the, what the person is proposing may not be what's in the best interest usually is not what is in the best interest of the community. For instance, a rhetorician might get up and say, we need to go to war against this city which has rebelled against us, which was you know, an actual event that happened. And we need to kill everybody because they have wronged us. They have violated the treaty. We need to punish them so that no one else will do this. All right? And people will listen to that and go, yes. And their anger, uh, you know, they will be angry. They will say, you know, we did so many good things for these people. Look how they repay us. They violated our agreement. It's the right thing to do. And we need to send a message to other people. But actually, if the Athenians did that, and they did do that the re because it couldn't be stopped, the result was bad for them because the message that was actually sent to other potential re rebellious people was fight to the death, you know, because the Athenians will kill you, uh, they will destroy you if you're not successful. So they didn't stop rebellions. Rebellions continued to happen. And there was no negotiating possible. So it turned out to not be good for the Athenians or other people, but when people voted for that, they felt like they were totally righteous. So the, the justice, the sort of false feeling of justice, that was conveyed by the speaker, was embraced by the people, and they all felt very good about themselves as they made this decision, okay? So Socrates says rhetoricians produce that false sense of justice, and they influence law, and they make laws through their influence, with their speaking, but they don't legislate. And he uses that latter term very specifically, too, because to him, Legislation involves actual deliberation, meaning um, politicians who actually get together and discuss, you know, and people in the case of Athens, which is hard to imagine, but uh, ordinary people getting together and discussing, um, you know, the, the ins and outs of the issues and looking at all the possible ramifications, which is something that's hardly ever done even in our own system. You know, it seems like we never think about three steps ahead and say, you know, if we vote for this, what are people likely to do with that? That's where we always screw up. You know, it's a good idea, but what are people, actual human beings, likely to do with that? What's it going to look like two years from now, five years from now, ten years from now? Okay, so that would be deliberation. You know, taking the time, and it takes a lot of time to sort through all that, hear all the opinions, think about the positives and the negatives and the unintended consequences that can happen from any decision that you make. So rhetoricians, in other words, he says, move people away from really deliberating in the assembly. 
they just encourage people to listen to these impassioned arguments and make their decision on the basis of not too much information. Okay? All right. Now, having said all this, so now we have the set piece, so to speak. We have, we have uh, you know, Gorgias saying what rhetoric is, and now we have Socrates saying what rhetoric is. So now we know what both of the two major, you know, polis aside for a moment. We know what the two major people in this dialogue think it is, and what it's for, and what the effects of it are. And so you can see by compar comparing those two points of view, you know, how opposite they really are. Okay. And now, Polis, having heard this evaluation of rhetoric by Socrates, says, yes, but. <coughs> okay, so rather than directly confronting him about his notion that rhetoricians are false teachers of justice. Okay? And when you think about it, that's not necessarily a dodge because Gorgias and Polis might agree, you know, since the aim of rhetoric for them is to get people to agree to what you want. Okay? They wouldn't necessarily disagree with Socrates' evaluation, but, but they would disagree that it's a bad thing to do this. Okay. Uh, so instead of tackling it directly and saying, no, 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 they're not false teachers of justice, they know what justice is, which he briefly tried before, um, Polis instead says, yes, but look at what the vast majority of people think about this. So he sort of steps back and he, he mentally takes a poll. Okay? A very, um, a, a very natural move to make in a democracy. Okay? is let's talk about what most people think and say. What do most people say? The vast majority of people admire rhetoricians. Okay? They look up to them. They listen to them. Okay? If they didn't, then the rhetoricians wouldn't have any power. Okay? And he says these, these people are so powerful that even though we are living in a democracy, they can, if they are popular enough, act as though they're tyrants, meaning they can make decisions really rather arbitrarily. They can do whatever they want with that popularity. Of course, the, the problem for them was you have to remain popular. And as Socrates points out later on, that's, Polis glosses over how hard that is. Okay? But as long as you remain popular, he's saying, you can, you can do whatever you want. You can do things like the video said the law wasn't really a very serious thing in Athens. That's really true, okay? because ultimately it was the will of the majority that prevailed. So if there was a law, which I'm sure there was, against stealing under normal circumstances, a popular politician could still get away with stealing okay, or getting rid of somebody either by banishing them or killing them without a trial, without any sort of legal procedures, just by the vote of the assembly. They could confiscate their property, take away their lands, tell them they had to leave, throw them in jail, all without a trial. Okay? They did have trials, but didn't have to have a trial. Okay? And as the video also pointed out, the trials weren't anything like what we know today. Because a whole lot of people were in that jury, and basically it was the same situation. They were voting on the basis of emotion. Okay? They weren't instructed in the way that jurors are today, only think about the law, you know? So, Polis is full of admiration. Who would not want to have this kind of power? Okay? He wants to have it. Okay? It's, everybody would like to have it. It's just that most people don't have the skills. They can't do it. Okay? So the alternative is to look up to them. Okay? These be kind of like the, uh, you know, the Hollywood stars, the, the TV stars, the, the music, the entertainment people of today. You know, People look up to them, you sort of fantasize about being one, you know, it'd be nice to be able to just, you know, play pool in your bathroom or whatever you want to do, you know, have a swimming pool in your limo. But, you know, most of us will never have the musical talent or the business acumen that it takes to be able to, uh, to, to live that kind of lifestyle. So we fantasize and we look up to them and we follow them and don't tell me you don't because otherwise half of those reality TV shows wouldn't exist, right? So, uh, 
Socrates' response to this is really pretty, pretty counterintuitive. Okay. Polis is saying, wow, look how much power they've got. Wouldn't anybody want it? And, and Socrates, rather than saying, well, they have a lot of power, but they abuse it, actually says at this point, I don't, I don't agree that they have power. So that's an unusual maneuver. Okay? It, it's got to mean that he thinks of power differently than Polis does. <coughs> Now, I'm a political scientist, and political scientists usually think of power as just the ability to get people to do things, okay, or, or to get things moving, you know, in the direction you want them. In other words, power equals um, force, coercion, or persuasion, but any means by which you can get people to do what they otherwise wouldn't do, okay. So, our definition of power as political scientists roughly more like polises, you know. And we would say that a dictator, if he's in control of his country, though he be a very bad human being who's very abusive, is still very powerful in that country. We just measure that by what he's capable of doing. Can he suppress a rebellion? You know, is he in charge of his military or are they about ready to break loose? You know, if he has all that power centralized and he's really in control, he's powerful. But Socrates would disagree with that. If, if, if it's not the ability to force or coerce, make things happen like that, then what do you think it is for Socrates? Where do you think he's going with this? Anybody, anybody have an idea what the alternative definition of power would be? Uh -huh. Socrates kind of says on like page 27, uh, by power you mean something good to the man who wills it. So I think he means you know being able to, to benefit, or do good for yourself. Yeah, right. Ultimately, and this is ironic, isn't it? Because wouldn't Polis say that power is at, is absolutely doing you know what it takes to to do good for yourself? And here we have Socrates saying power is doing what is good for yourself. So, but you don't know what is good for yourself, okay? You think about, um, you know, the dictator in North Korea, Kim Jong-un, who's, you know, involved in shuttle diplomacy with the basketball player right now. Um, <laughs> Dennis, no, who is it, the basketball player? Uh, Rodman. Rodman. Rodman, Dennis Rodman, I thought so. So, so Kim Jong-un probably feels as though he's really powerful and he's in control of his people, his military, although I've been wondering when they're going to stop cooperating with him, but, you know, for whatever reason, he seems to be able to do that. And, uh, uh, and he probably thinks that he's incredibly powerful, and I guess we would have to agree that at least within North Korea, not outside of North Korea, but within North Korea, he's powerful, okay? Um, and Socrates would say no because you are not doing what actually benefits you. So this requires looking from the outside in rather than the inside out. Okay? Now we all, when we think of Kim Jong-un, it's really either we think how sad for his people because they've suffered for so long and they're so poor, right, and they don't have any ability to make a living and they're, some of them are starving, and they're afraid of him and his military. Okay? The country is so impoverished that they, 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 they live on the aid of countries that they, that they say they hate, including us. And, you know, this is kind of pathetic. And then we think about Kim Jong-un. Could he travel anywhere in the world safely? can't even really travel in his own country safely. I mean, a man like that has to constantly watch out, you know, because there's, there's enemies everywhere. Everybody hates the man. Even people who say they love him, I'm sure, hate him. You know, nobody likes him. Except for Dennis Rodman. That's, I don't know. So, you know, from the outside in, when we're not saying how pathetic and how sad, we do joke about it because that's how ridiculous Kim Jong-un's choices seem to be. He's, he's, he's got a terribly poor, totally militarized country that can accomplish nothing but building 
weapons, we hope not, you know, uh, to the point of actually being able to do something against us or other countries. But is that really the height of success? Okay. He's got total control. I'm sure he lives in a palace. He's got, you know, he probably has the swimming pool in his limo. Who knows? But, you know, I mean, is that, is that really admirable? Not from the outside, you know. Would you want to live that way? I mean, there's lots of reasons to not want to live that way. So he thinks, and, and here's the, the, the terrible thing about the power of somebody like Kim Jong-un. If he ever had a moment where he thought, I've gone wrong, there is no, which he's not going to have probably, but if, <laughs> if he ever did, he would not be able to stop anyway because he cannot step back from what he's doing. He cannot step back because someone will immediately kill him. Okay. He has built himself a, a trap, basically. So Socrates' view is a, a powerful ruler not only has the means to make things happen, but knows what to do with it so that he can truly benefit his people, which will end up benefiting him. Okay. The two go hand in hand. If your people are peaceful, prosperous, happy, that's going to come back on you, okay? And you are going to have the freedom to make decisions. You're not going to have to feel as though uh, you're afraid all the time or paranoid. And, of course, one of the great, uh, uh, you know, effects of this type of leadership is paranoia. Now, so the question that Socrates poses to, to Polis and really to Gorgias too is can a rhetorician do that which he thinks is useful to him, but which turns out to harm him? Okay, and the reason—I mean, I could have picked so many people. So you know, if you like Newt Gingrich, don't take offense. But um, you know, there—I mean, so many politicians could be highlighted at this point. You know, who have thought that they were making great decisions and that would benefit them, and uh, totally enthused about their decisions, but it turns out to harm them. In Gingrich's case, I've just got a quote up here from the last, uh, the, the election before last, I guess. Um, no, it was his last election, yeah. Where he basically uh, leaped into Mitt Romney, and he did this repeatedly, just calling him an absolute liar, okay? They were two Republicans duking it out for the nomination, okay? And this type of rhetoric, which I think you know, Newt Gingrich really believes, you know, that, that Mitt Romney and other people are liars. He uses very inflammatory language. He, he's got strong convictions. He's very, very bright. And he finds it very hard to not say exactly what he thinks at all times. But the problem is, is it just, it just backfires on him every time. He is like a little, a little hand grenade that goes off and blows himself up on a regular basis. And, and he can't ever be president because he just doesn't have the self-control to be able to not say things like this. Okay? So it's not, this isn't in his interest, but it felt good at the moment. Okay? And, it, and it, in his view, it was absolutely right. right? So, uh, so yes, I mean, the answer, I mean, obviously the answer is yes, they do it all the time. Politicians do it all the time, sometimes in really spectacular ways. Okay? Sometimes in, in subtle ways, sometimes it's really sad. But they do it all the time because they're human beings, okay? And they end up uh, hurting themselves and their prospects and so forth. So uh, what Socrates is saying is that power comes from knowing first what is truly good for you, which is what will be good for others as well, okay? But from the political scientist perspective, that's like saying that these three guys, all of whom were the, you know, were or are the leaders of the free world, so to speak, the greatest, uh, most powerful country on the face of the earth, were not powerful whenever they made a mistake, and they've all made mistakes. You know, some really spectacular ones, some that really hurt themselves and their country, etc. Because they're human beings, okay, like Bill Clinton. Very successful in a lot of respects, but decided to have that affair with Monica Lewinsky, and it just really uh, did him a lot of damage. It didn't totally destroy him, but that decision 
which felt good at the moment, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> was, uh, was really a bad, bad decision for his ultimate goals and the good of the country. See, they, go, they, went, they went together, all right? So anyway, uh, they're still powerful because they can still make things happen, but Socrates is saying true power means knowing what to do with it too so that you can continue to wield it well to your benefit which is the benefit of others too in his view they go hand in hand that you can't exploit your people and not pay the price for that ultimately okay so power has to come from intelligence or to put it another way intelligence needs to precede power it's more important, okay? And it's what makes a person truly powerful, okay? Which means that you have to know what is best for you and that takes time to figure out, okay? It takes a long time. Some people will uh, figure it out earlier than others. Okay? Some people never figure it out. And uh, you have to spend time sorting that out, right? And then you will know what will truly make you happy in the long run, right? And uh, this means that, basically, this is the importance of philosophy. Okay, this is how he gets in his defense of philosophy. The philosophy to him isn't some esoteric study in a philosophy department that's highly specialized and produces a gajillion journals. Okay? Philosophy is you know, thinking about life in a systematic way, being honest and open and having dialogues with other people. Okay? So it's a very practical thing, really, but very few people engage in that or they don't do it long enough to be able to discover what they really uh, should want out of life and what will truly make them happy. Okay. So we plunge into whatever it is that society tells us we're supposed to want or some you know, role model that isn't really good for us tells us what we're, that we're supposed to want or rhetorician tells us, and we don't take the time to think it through independently for ourselves. So that's what he means by the unexamined life is not worth living. Okay? So to bring it down to you know, our lives, all right, um, in the way that he thinks, um, this is a question that we should all ask ourselves. I, I have a 16-year-old son. He'll be going to college. He's actually going to graduate, and he just announced to me, like, uh, a semester early, I guess. So I said, you can do that if you'll come here to K-State. I think that's what he's going to do. But in the last year or so, he's been finally discerning kind of what's interesting to him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I made sure that he got a good education in both mathematics and science, as well as in uh, humanities type of things and literature. I really tried to make sure that he could make that decision for himself so that he wasn't forced into it, like so many people, by having a bad education and not knowing how to do enough math to be able to decide whether you want to be an engineer or whatever. And it turns out after struggling against the, uh, the, p the pressure, I mean, that there's an enormous amount of pressure to be an engineer or some kind of scientist, okay? Um, because all the programs for kids are, you know, STEM, 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 STEM. There's no humanities programs out there at all. There's no humanities camps, okay? But the darn kid, he reads constantly. I mean, he's, I stopped having to, I never did, no. A long time ago, I stopped even trying to regulate his reading. He reads independently, he reads voraciously, he has all sorts of interests that I try to keep up with, but I, I can't in some cases. Right now, he's reading Thomas Pynchon and I've read The Crying of Lot 49, and that's about as much as I can handle. Okay. Uh, but he's, he's moving in that direction. Well, that's not a field that normally you would associate with big bucks. Okay? But what I say is you can only be successful in this world if you're doing what you love. If you are in some field because you think that it's lucrative, you will not be able to be successful not unless you enjoy it. So 
think about this. You know, what do you do? What if you think that money brings happiness, and you think of money first? What kind of majors are you likely to look into? What are the big ones? Business, business engineering. Okay. Yeah, back there. Lawyer, doctor, business engineering. Anything else? Yeah, major. These major professions, right? Um, that's the avenue for people who don't have a lot of family wealth. Okay, if you have a lot of family wealth, then it becomes, you know, inheriting your parents' business or taking that wealth and going and making your own business as an entrepreneur. Okay, but a lot, awful lot of us don't have that opportunity, which I think sounds really exciting. But again, you have to have your heart in it. How many people in business inherit their parents' business and their heart isn't in it and they blow it? They totally blow it because they don't love it. You know, I watched this. Uh, Oh, what's the name of it now? Kitchen Nightmares with Gordon Ramsay. Because okay? I like the way he just blows at people constantly and tells them exactly what he thinks. And uh, I'd say about 75% of the time, the problem is with these people is their heart's not in it. They've got this restaurant that they bought on a whim. You know, they like sold everything they had to buy this. Oh, wouldn't it be nice to own a cafe? Or, or they inherited it from their father or mother. And, um, and, and they just really don't like cooking, you know, they've, they've, a lot of them have never taken a cooking class. They think they can do it, but they start serving slop to people and people don't like it. And then they wonder, what's wrong? Why aren't I making any money? I'm going bankrupt. Okay. So they have this wonderful, wonderful opportunity and they just blow it. Okay. Because they, they really aren't cooks. They really aren't business owners at heart. And I would suspect the same thing would go with engineering. Even if you are uh, really good at mathematics, okay? and like I said, I made sure my son was. He actually is in trigonometry. He's going to do uh, calculus, I think, next next semester, and then whatever comes after that. <laughs> I never got past geometry. <laughs> I had a crappy education in high school, so. You know, he's good at it, he's doing great, but you know, if he decided to become an engineer with the type of interest he had, it would be like going through the motions. He just wouldn't, I doubt if he would enjoy it, unless he has a sudden change of heart. So then how far can you get if you're mediocre at what you do? Though you have the skill, <coughs> you don't have that ambition if your heart's not in it. So, and of course in personal relationships, how do you form your personal, what kind of mate are you looking for if you're thinking mainly of money? Ooh. <laughs> yeah. The son or daughter of somebody who owns a business? Uh, somebody that has money. Yeah, somebody who has money either by inheriting it or, you know, a professional like a doctor, right? Which happens both ways now. It used to be mainly women looking for, you know, lawyer types or doctor types, but now it's definitely both ways, okay? But what do you suppose happens to those marriages a few years in? Yeah, they do, you know, at an alarming rate because they didn't get into it for the right reason. And they find out after a while that really the stuff, the lifestyle isn't enough, you know, because you've got you to live with this person every day. You're sleeping with them every night, maybe, you know, <laughs> maybe not. And it's just demoralizing, and so they break up, you know, and then, of course, they, it's nasty, and the, the, the money gets split up, but does it make people happy? I think it makes people even more unhappy. So, you know, Socrates is trying to get Gorgias and Polis to think about this issue seriously, because happiness is what we want. You know, at the end of the day, that is what we want. We want to be happy. We want to feel satisfied. Mm -hmm. And we go down all of these different paths that we think maybe our family tells us or society tells us, you know, are lucrative, successful paths without ever really knowing who we are and what we really want based on what would really satisfy us. Okay? We don't take that time. So he's arguing with a young guy who is enthralled with, with, uh, with Gorgias and, and who's convinced of his admiration for him and who hasn't taken the time to think this through. Okay, So he goes on, that is Polis goes on, 
uh, with his discussion of those people who are admirable and powerful, and he actually goes to somebody who is not a democratic politician, somebody who is who comes from a country that is a dictatorship. Okay, so he makes this jump from talking about you know the politicians who wouldn't want to be like them to this this uh, Archelaus character, and this is on page 34 or near 471, who is a, di a dictator, basically, um, who got his power through all sorts of unjust means. And I'll just read a little bit of his de description. Because he's throwing him up as somebody to, you know, who wouldn't want to be like this? He says, he was born from a slave woman of Perdiccas's brother, Alcides, who, was, who by rights, so by rights, he was Alcides' slave. And if he wanted to act justly, he, could, he would still be his slave, and happy, according to your account. But as it is, it's quite amazing how wretched he has become since he has been guilty of the gravest acts of injustice. The first thing he did was send for his own master, his uncle, under the pretext of restoring him to the power which Perdiccas had usurped. Well, he entertained Alcides and his son Alexander, his own cousin, a boy about the same age as himself, got them drunk, threw them in a wagon, drove them off into the night, cut their throats, and no one ever saw them again. And when he had committed this crime, quite unaware that he had become the most wretched man, he experienced no repentance. He had a brother, the legitimate son of Perdiccas, a child about seven years old, to whom the kingdom belonged by rights. So a little later, not wishing to become happy or to bring up his brother in accordance with justice or to give him back his kingdom, he threw him into a well and drowned him. <laughs> Telling the mother Cleopatra that the boy had been pursuing a goose when he fell in and died. So now, since he is the greatest criminal in Macedonia, Archelaus is the most wretched of the Macedonians, not the happiest, he says. Yeah sarcastically. I dare say there are plenty of Athenians, beginning with you, who would be willing to take the place of any other Macedonian whatever rather than the Archelaus. Okay, again, he's being sarcastic. But really, he's saying, who wouldn't want to be Archelaus? Are you kidding me? If you asked Archelaus if he was happy, what would he say? Yes, I got away with it, you know. I was going to be a slave, which is unjust, that was wrong, just because my mother was a slave. And I did what it takes to make it happen so that I could get the power that should be mine, in his view, I'm sure, because my father was the king. Of course, I had to get rid of the legitimate heir, the seven-year-old. Okay. But, you know, but I've got it now, and because I have that power, no one can punish me for it, which is something Polis points out here. You know, no one can punish him. He can't pay any price for it because he's the law. So, of course, he's happy. And furthermore, wouldn't anyone want to have this? Okay, so it's just interesting that he makes this leap from. He doesn't talk about Pericles or some other past Athenian leader who turned, who became so powerful, but he actually talks about a tyrant, okay? So Socrates again predictably says, no, somebody like Archelaus is weak, he is to be despised, he is to be pitied, because he has no real power. Okay. So you can imagine what we talked about with Kim Jong-un, this is the type of scenario that he thinks is going on with Archelaus. Anybody who who gets power through this kind of ruthlessness, which everybody can observe, okay? The killing of innocent children, uh, you know, terrorizing people, Stalin-esque type of, you know, Stalin climbed to power by, by killing and intimidating the right people at the right time and just scared people to death. And that's how he got to power, okay? But then, you know, once in power, they would say, yes, I'm happy, you know, I have everything I want, but what you don't know is what's going on in their heads. So you think about some of these people like Stalin or Mao or Adolf Hitler who managed in the 20th century to gain such tremendous power 
over their people and beyond. Okay? And you think about how their lives actually turned out. And you know if you've read any of the histories of these people, you know they were, uh, well, I would, I would use the term paranoid, except for paranoid implies a false, a totally false, you know, feeling of being persecuted and followed and so forth. But in this case, it is justified, you know. But these, these people, would, they got rather strange, let's say, as time went by and isolated and insulated themselves ever more because they couldn't trust, they didn't feel like they could trust anybody. You know, not even their own families, not the people who guarded them, not their chief advisors. There, was, there always had to be some way to check up on everybody. And they would frequently kill those uh, closest to them uh, because they suspected them or they just wanted to make sure that everybody knew what would happen to them if they didn't obey. Now that's a world that is sort of through the looking glass, basically, you know. And when, again, when you look at it from the outside, would you really want to be there? You know, not even just the obvious moral reasons. I hope that all of us are good people and would never want to touch any of the things that these, these men did, but even for reasons of the pure power, because it comes with this great price of so many enemies. Okay? I think it's in the Republic where Socrates talks about, you know, if you take a slaveholder and you miraculously could drop that slave owner into the desert or someplace where the society and its laws couldn't protect him, what do you think would happen? Well, you know, they say, well, the slaves would revolt and kill him. Okay? So the only thing standing between the slave owner and that mass revolt is the cooperation of the law, which you can't always count on, and it depends upon the circumstances. So there's, there's, there's a constant fear, and there's, there's not a lot of reward. Now, these were probably all sociopaths, so they probably didn't care too much about uh, what other people think. But if you're not a sociopath, there is a part of, of a human being that does care about what other people think and where their admiration and their loyalty comes from. Is it out of sheer fear, or is it because you actually deserve it? Well, none of these types of leaders can claim that it's because they actually deserve it. And as Socrates is going to point out, in addition, all of these types of people, Archelaus, any dictator like that, will, will have everything he wants all the time. You know, banquets, any women that they want to be with, uh, whatever, okay? But they just want more. There is no end, you know. If they can go on a campaign of conquest, there's, like Hitler, there was no end to his ambitions. He would never be satisfied until he conquered the whole world. Okay? So this, in Socrates' view, is, is like a constant hunger that can't be filled. You're empty, and you try your best to fill it, but you can't. This is painful in his view. So we'll see more how he justifies that argument. Okay. 